and welcome to Studying the Steps, a podcast from the Magdalen House, a recovery community for alcoholic women. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Dallas, Texas, and known affectionately by many as Maggie's. In this series, we take a deeper dive into the 12 steps as outlined in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous through discussion with an alcoholic woman active in our recovery community, and with me, your host, Kelsey Amos, a recovered alcoholic and the Next Step Program Manager at the Magdalene House. Their personal experience and knowledge of work in the program can give insight on how anyone can apply and practice the spiritual principles to improve their lives. Please note, the curriculum we teach through our programs at Maggie's is from the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. However, we are not an Alcoholics Anonymous group, and we are not associated with AA. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for listening. Can you give us your name, introduce yourself, and then let us know how you got connected here at the Magdalene House as a meeting chair? Yeah. My name is Nina Herndon. Um, I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic, and I've been sober since January 5th of 2015. I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> um, and I'm, I've been involved with Maggie since, you know, As soon as I got sober, I remember the first um, time I called my sponsor to make a 10th step, she told me to go to Maggie's. And I said, what is Maggie's? (laughs) Um, And I looked it up online and um, I showed up to that house and there were two doors and I didn't know which door to knock on or go in or what I was supposed to do. And, you know, ever since then, I remember for that specific incident, she said, go to Maggie's ask a woman how she's doing, shut up and listen. And so um, I started coming to meetings really regularly and I got to sub a couple meetings uh, back in the day and that was always really exciting and terrifying. And and then now, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to jump in and chair meetings and I just, I love it. That's awesome. Can you tell us what does recovery mean to you versus sobriety? Yes, I love this question, um, especially because I think that one of the most special things about Maggie's is that it is so emphasized here and we learned so much about what recovery really is. Um, I mean, I came to the program to get sober. That's all I wanted. I wanted to get sober. I didn't want to die. I was tired of living the way that I was living and I got that and then I got all this other stuff. And, you know, there was no way in hell that I was going to ever consider myself an alcoholic. Um, There was no way in hell I was ever going to be sober. But I really realized that, um, you know, when I worked the steps and I got plugged in and I got a sponsor and I started 10-stepping and going to meetings, even though I didn't want to, and I got a commitment and I never wanted to go to that. And, you know, it was like, I always talk about recovery as kind of being this thing that I don't really want to do, but it's really, really what I need. And I always do the thing I don't want to do. And I feel a hundred times better. You know, it's, it's not like a feelings program by any means, but recovery has taught me how to not live in my will and I still take over my will. (laughs) Um, But it has taught me how to not live in my will, and what I get as a result of that is recovery. It's freedom. It's a life that is infinitely more exciting than anything I could have thought about for myself. Um, I think of the line, our little plans and designs. We become less and less interested in our little plans and designs, and I'm still interested in my my little plan and design because I want to know, like, what's next for me? Like, you know, where's God going to lead me and, and, you know, tell me what's behind door number two because I'm ready to open door number two. But living this program has taught me how to be where my feet are, um, to trust that things are going to work out for me no matter what, like, as long as I keep showing up and, and doing what I know to to do through what this program has taught me and and follow the guidance and direction of my sponsor, everything works out. And uh, before I got sober, nothing was working out and everything was a mess. And the harder I tried, the more messy it got. And, um, you know, that is the beautiful thing about this program is that I no longer have just sobriety. I have recovery and holy moly, it is so much more exciting than what I thought I was getting into when I first started. That is beautiful. I just Thank love you. your spirit. <laughs> like you're just like glowing when you're talking about it and it's so pretty. It's just awesome. I love it. What does it mean for you today to stay spiritually fit? I love 
the 10 step promises and it mentions, you know, staying spiritually fit, um, that we're not to rest on our laurels, which is anything that we did before today. And it is really, I'm, I always say I'm really, really lazy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would much rather sit at home and binge watch whatever show I'm into at the moment and not do anything. I don't want to go take a walk. I don't want to go fill up my water bottle. I don't want (laughs) to do any of these things because my inherent nature is laziness. And this spiritual fitness, I've had a lot of people describe it a lot of different ways to me over the years, but I think like for me, it like always equates to like physical fitness, you know, and I am not by any means like somebody who is going out and doing weightlifting competitions or doing CrossFit or I don't do anything um, other than I've recently started walking every day. But I always say like it is as simple as walking every day. Like staying spiritually fit is it's not anything that's overly complicated and um, I can make it overly complicated because God I can make everything overly complicated. But spiritual fitness is it's answering the phone when I have a woman I'm sponsoring calling me and I feel like it always, I'd never want to answer when I'm like scrolling and I'm like, dang it. (laughs) Uh, Do I have to answer this? And I've not answered it before. Um, but I know now when I answer that phone that it's going to, it, God does for me what I cannot do for myself. Like I hang up the phone and I'm so grateful that I did answer the phone um, because I've I've stopped thinking about myself. It's me calling my sponsor to make 10th steps. Um, Now that I feel like I'm in a period where things are really smooth, I've got a lot of girls that I'm I'm talking to and I feel like I'm like, I feel like I'm out of myself. Like I am doing great. (laughs) Um, And you know, I have a weekly call scheduled with my sponsor so that I still continue to check in with her and, and not, you know, not get ahead of myself. Because again, like this whole thing is keeping me grounded. And, and, and I just, I always know that like the thing that I don't want to do is the thing that is going to help keep me spiritually fit. And it's like the same thing with like physical exercise. I don't want to do it, but I know if I do it, it'll help keep me like more physically fit. And I talk about this program a lot too as like a prescription. I have to take my prescriptions every day for the things that I have. And if I don't, like symptoms start to reappear. And this is my prescription, you know, for my alcoholism. And um, the more I take it regularly, the easier it becomes to take it regularly. And it's just a part of my life as opposed to this thing that I remember feeling when I first got sober of like, oh, I have to do this. Oh, I have to do this. Like, and now it's like, oh, I get to do this. Mm -hmm. And I always heard people say that. (laughs) Um, But it's true because you just know it's the best thing in the world to be like at that place where you're done and you don't want to live anymore. And you find that like, oh my gosh, life is incredible and I'm excited to live it. And then you want to share that with somebody else. Just all of that was beautiful. I love that. I think it's a beautiful example of recovery. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Nina, so much for being here today. Thank this you was for a joy. Me. Yeah. I appreciate it. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us how you got connected here at the Magdalene House as a meeting chair? Hi, my name is Brittany Trell. My sobriety date is 3 Um, How I got connected to Maggie's was in July of 2019 I entered medical detox and they uh, sent me over to Maggie's essentially they were very um, persistent about me going to Maggie's and so I came over here Um, I wasn't ready in 2019 so I went back out and returned in uh, March of 2022 and from there I went into next step and I did everything that everybody told me, especially Kelsey. <laughs> and I ended up doing the overnight thing and being a chair. And I love it. It's awesome. A uh, question I want to ask you is, what does recovery mean to you versus sobriety? So recovery versus sobriety. So I got a DWI and I actually left Maggie's um, in July 2019, two days early to go to my court case. So I ended up having to be sober for a little bit over a year and 
I had a blower, so I had to blow into it three times a day. Mm -hmm. So that kept me sober because I was going to jail if I didn't, you know, blow clean. And so looking back now, I was completely miserable because I I had only addressed the physical part of the disease, um, which just stopped drinking, right? That fixes it within three days. You're not physically craving. Um, but I was living with the mental part, the mental illness, and it wasn't it wasn't being addressed. So there wasn't any joy. There wasn't any hope. I, I was only living completely in fear and a lot of resentment. So as soon as um, my probation was done, I went immediately to the liquor store, like left the um, the smart start, which is the blower. I left that place and immediately went to the liquor store and got vodka. So then I was out for about six months and that six months just did me in. Like I was, I was way worse than I had ever been. And I had had that year of sobriety and I, it was, it was starting to show that I couldn't do it on my own, that it just wasn't going to work. Um, and then fast forward to now, I have the tools to seek those things like joy and peace, you know, and like I've been taught how to address the mental illness and maintain my recovery. And so <clears throat> I'm able to live my life in a way that's thriving, like I'm thriving versus just surviving. Yeah, and like literally, like I, I the thoughts when I was dry or or sober were so dark and um you know like just just dark versus now like I I know how to change those into positive progressive thoughts that's wonderful how did you how did you get from that dark miserable place to where you are now so funny you ask the steps really like like honestly the steps I, I did not think that they were gonna work but the the second time through Maggie's when when I looked at the steps on the wall like it was just this profound thing I saw like I looked at all the steps and I saw them connecting me to God versus getting me sober mm -hmm. and like that just change in thought thought process is just just help me start right you know they tell you to listen to Every, to listen to your sponsor, right? And to listen to the recovered woman and to do everything that they say to do. And I still do it. Like, I, because I know that I am, I don't look at the women that are, that are just out of the house with two weeks. I don't look at them as any different from me. Like, because maybe I have some more experience to like maybe help them out a little bit, but I am still affected with alcoholism and I have to keep my body straight by not drinking and I have to keep my mind straight more importantly so I don't ever get to a point where I'm even considering it. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to chair some meetings, I'm going to overnight, I'm going to put my heart and soul into helping other people because every time I do that, I walk away feeling better. And so if I know I feel like crap one day, um, I know that I keep those commitments because they're there for a reason. Um, and it's to keep me away from being dry or being, you know, just sober. I can't do that. It's not sustainable for me because I want to live a life that's happy and joyous and free. But I, I'm not the person that I am today when I'm just sober. So it kind of sounds like the main difference that you're talking about is this this idea of being spiritually fit. So what does it look like for you to be spiritually fit or to stay spiritually fit today? The number one thing I do is to help other people. And then um, after that comes prayer and meditation. And then after that comes um, eating healthy and exercising, um, you know, hanging out with my friends, doing all of that. But if I don't have those first two, I'm not connected to God the way that I should be. Right. Number one is helping people. So once a week, um, I make sure I have a commitment. And now there's things like this. And um, if Next Step ever asks me to do something, I always say yes because that program saved my life. Uh, first Step did too. 
and then of course you know all the other stuff of just being a human but those two are definitely what keep me spiritually fit awesome well thank you so much for being here today this has been amazing I hope that the listeners will hear your spirit coming through the sound waves because I can feel it right now so thank you you, Brittany So I'm sitting here with one of our wonderful meeting chairs, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Hi, (laughs) I'm Michelle Hope. I've been sober since April 8th of 2013. Wonderful. Can you tell us how you got connected to the Magdalene House as a meeting chair? Yes, Uh, my sponsor. She is heavily involved with the house and I guess it was maybe four or five years ago she actually asked me to be involved with the board so I got to be on the board through our capital campaign of raising money and funds for the new house and we built this beautiful home now and uh, after that I started chairing meetings here. That is so awesome I didn't know that you were involved with the board first. I learn something new every day. So I wanted to ask you, what does recovery mean to you versus sobriety? So when I think about being recovered, I think about being happy, joyous, and free. I've been in the rooms now, you know, consistently. I have gone to a meeting every week for the past 10 plus years. And, you know, sometimes you'll go in and you'll see people that are not happy, but they're sober. And it, it always struck me in the beginning when I would see people like that as, why would you even be continue to come here if you're so unhappy <laughs> not being sober, you know? Maybe you need to go get a drink. So uh, that's been the biggest difference for me. And I've always been drawn to people that have that freedom, that happiness, and they're sober. Uh, because in the beginning, before I understood my illness and the end, what I understood the recovery process, I really thought that it was going to be miserable. I thought I was going to be depriving myself of fun and not being able to go where alcohol was or be around people that were drinking, like I was just going to stay home a lot and stuff like that. I didn't know that I wasn't going to be fighting the feeling to drink every day like I had been or trying to do at least. So to go to a bar and be around people that are drunk and not even think about drinking or even seeing those people and going, gosh, I'm so glad that's not me. And knowing that I'm not gonna be hung over the next day and just, that's almost a spiritual experience in itself is recognizing when other people are drinking and you don't want that. You know, that a complete psychic change for me when I don't want anything mind altering. I even thought, gosh, I really need to de- you know, detox off a of coffee because I'm starting to feel really jittery. <laughs> and that's unusual yeah. to not want to change the way that I feel. So I would say being recovered for me is not just being sober, but being happy about being sober. That's beautifully said. Thank you. (laughs) Yes. So what was the process for you to get from being sober to being happy about being sober? What did that look like? That's actually a good question because I know in the beginning, you know, I came into the rooms and I I read the steps on the wall and I said, those are stupid. I'm not going to do that. And about two weeks later I was vibrating in my chair and thinking I want to drink I want to drink I want to drink and everybody just kept saying you know if you don't get a sponsor and work the steps you're gonna get drunk and I was so desperate enough to where I just threw my hands up and I said okay fine and I asked someone to sponsor me and I started working the steps and it's been it was a gradual process I didn't necessarily not want to drink for several months while I was going through the step work Uh, but the the nice thing was that God actually removed the compulsion Mm -hmm. to drink the desire was still there but the compulsion wasn't so I managed to not drink even though I still kind of wanted to I was very uncomfortable around alcohol I didn't walk down the grocery aisle where it was I couldn't watch it on TV you know it was it was a bit of a challenge for for several months But for me, once I started making my amends and got 
to the 10th step place, as it talks about in our book, and those 10 step promises, that's when they really started coming true. So for me, the 10 step promises came true at the 10th step point. Mm. I had to do one through nine before I started to feel that obsession fully lifting. Mm. And I know that I recognized it because I was in a bar waiting for, I was actually, I was in a restaurant at the bar waiting for a table and there were all these beautiful alcohol bottles and people drinking the martinis and it just they were having you know the joyous time and I thought wow I've been sitting here for like 10 minutes and I haven't thought about drinking once and that was such a change for me because I would you know was drinking or thinking about drinking every day it was the first thing that I thought about in the morning when I woke up and and you know now the first thing I think about is God and that's a miracle, really. Mm. It's really beautiful. So today, what does it look like for you to stay spiritually fit? I think that my spiritual maturity has really started to develop in the past few years. And part of it comes with the understanding that I have an illness that is set out to make me unhappy and kill me. So when my thinking goes to a place of self-loathing or self-defeat or things like that, I recognize that that's my illness talking to me. And I don't know that I would have done that maybe even five years ago. I would have gone with it. I would have thought, well, gosh, yeah, I am being a, you know, this or that, and I really can't do this or that, you know, and now when I think about those things, I think, you know, no, that's your illness talking, and you need to, you need God right now. You need to get with God right now, and, and I've been through enough hardship, I should say, or pain in sobriety and didn't drink from turning to God. And also from having a nice support system of women and, and men as well in the program and, and family members that I've cultivated stronger relationships with since I've been sober that I didn't have when I was drinking, that I n now ask for help. I didn't ever ask for help. I was really into isolating when I was drinking and, and, and blaming or numbing and all those things. So now it's like, I'm a human being and if I want to feel love, I got to feel the pain too and allowing myself to feel the feelings but understand that they are fickle and that this isn't a feelings program. My sponsor tells me that all the time. This is not a feelings program. It is it is doing the right thing regardless about how I feel about it. And when I do those things and when I allow myself to be of service or to be thoughtful for other people first, God somehow comes in and, and and helps me with my challenges. The book tells us that we need to pray for others and not for selfish ends and stuff like that. And I don't know that I did that for a really, really, really long time. But I think the, that a spiritual maturity comes from praying for others when you're not just praying for yourself alone yeah. and thinking about others and, and accepting others. That was always a big thing for me. And I, I might not be the best at it even now, but trying to put other people's feelings first instead of just thinking about my own it's a daily struggle <laughs> but it's a desire that I have which I never had before and so I definitely think that that's a big part of it for me awesome. thank you so much Michelle for coming in today thank you Kelsey thank thanks you and y'all can check out Michelle's meeting on Saturdays here at Maggie's Hey everybody, I'm sitting here with one of our fabulous meeting chairs. So I'm gonna let her introduce herself and then can you just tell us how you got connected here at the Magdalene House as a meeting chair? Hi, I'm Rachel Palmer and I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. I got connected in being a meeting chair here um, by going through the Magdalene House and then completing Next Step and that's how I got plugged in to staying connected with Maggie's. Then they eventually asked me to be a meeting chair, so. Awesome. What's your sobriety date? 9-3-21. That's so cool. That is so cool because I saw you when you came in yes, and I did. think it's beautiful <laughs> that you're still here. Can you tell us what does recovery mean to you versus just sobriety? Recovery to me is working the program, staying connected with my higher power, um, 
with steps 10, 11, and 12, and the freedom that recovery gives me um, versus sobriety is just, in my vision, is just not drinking, but not having a program. So I'm kind of miserable, like in my vision (laughs) of what it would be like. Kind of a follow-up question to that. So you talked about freedom. What does that look like for you today? Um, The tools to release the bondage of myself, to be honest with you. Um, So I can look at myself and my part and what's going on and staying connected, you know, with my higher power. And the, the freedom is just... I don't know how else to explain it just free like I feel ha- like honestly like it says happy joyous and free and there's no explanation behind it that I can see besides doing the the, the work which is you know 10 and 11 and, and when I don't then I feel heavier and I don't feel like this happy and joyous and and then I'm always consumed with everything you know, and I guess being free is not being consumed with everything and I can just be still and be present. Yeah. I love that you talked that like that you mentioned the freedom from the bondage of self, right? Yeah. It's such a beautiful promise. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so last question. What does it mean to you or what does it look like for you to stay spiritually fit today? Staying connected with my mentor and doing my nightly inventories um taking a look at myself and being um responsible for my actions and you know connecting with my higher power and when i don't i can feel it like internally um and it doesn't take long so just staying in spirit and staying connected with other women um Mm -hmm. in the program that i've met um other women that i help staying in service all of those i think play into staying spiritually fit for me yeah, absolutely. What would you say to somebody, and this is, I'm just flying by the seat of my pants, I just okay. thought of this, but what would you say to somebody who is maybe on the fence about coming to Maggie's and getting help? I would say do it because if you think about it, then it's probably something that could definitely help you. Coming to Maggie's was life-changing for me. I couldn't imagine the life I have today before. Maggie's truly has opened up this whole new world and life and meaning and friends and stuff that I didn't dream of and I didn't know I wanted in my life either. So it's just pretty special place and it's nothing but welcome and love here. So it's pretty magical. <laughs> it is. And it's awesome seeing you so plugged in and, and being a real vital part of our community. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. Hi, will you give us your name and then tell us how you got connected here at Maggie's as a meeting chair? Sure thing. My name is Chloe Kramer. My sobriety date is July 7th, 1992. And, you know, I got connected as a meeting chair really just by reaching out. I mean, I had already been involved at the Magdalene House in a bunch of different ways and I just think it's like the coolest place ever. You know, my first introduction way, you know, a bunch of years ago now was being told that when I was moving to Dallas that I had to come check out Maggie's because God lived here. And so that was when I first walked in at Redwood Circle, that was what I was looking for was to see where God lived. You know, really that's what keeps me like sending people here and recommending to people to come and just go to the meetings here or if they need help sending them here but you know for me today I just I I didn't have a service commitment and I believe so strongly in what the Magdalene House does and so I reached out to Bren and asked her if there were any openings and she said there was and so that's that's how I got the the gig awesome thank you My next question is, what does recovery mean to you versus sobriety? That's a super important question. I mean, I think on one hand it can be semantics, but it's really not. It's it's a pretty profound difference that I think just a lot of people don't really maybe think about all the time. Like, obviously sobriety has to be in place for recovery to be possible. Like, I can't be recovered if I'm not sober, but... And I say this a lot, sober sucks, you know, sober is just the worst. It's so uncomfortable. So being sober and not being recovered is 
excruciating. That's what I believe the big book means by restless, irritable discontent. That's the bedevilments on page 52. That's where I am unable to control my emotional natures, where I am just really that you know, actor playing the director in step three, where I'm trying to make everybody else behave a certain way so that I can be okay when I am sober, but not recovered. And I think, you know, recovery is about accessing a power greater than myself. Really, that's really as simple as it is. And the way that I have learned how to access that power and stay in relationship with that power is through you know, doing the steps, staying in the steps, living in 10, 11, and 12. And, you know, if lack of power is my dilemma, then my solution is power. And so having power, not my own power, but having relationship with a power greater than myself, that is what being recovered is for me. That's, you know, it's being, you know, the big book talks about recovering from a hopeless state of mind and body and that's what it is but there's also all of these promises about being rocketed into the fourth dimension and really just being such a changed person that all of our you know we have this huge displacement and rearrangement and you know it really it's just about being changed and being happy joyous and free and having serenity and peace and being able to have relationships with people based on like love and respect rather than what i'm going to get out of it i love that What does it look like for you today to stay spiritually fit? It looks like action. You know, I remember when I first got sober, this program just seemed like the worst idea ever. And mostly because it really is my responsibility to stay recovered. I don't have the power, obviously that's God, but I I have the responsibility to take the action um, to stay close to God and I just had such a bad track record of keeping with anything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I, it's like, I love the part in more about alcoholism where it talks about like how we try all of these things, you know, taking a trip, not taking a trip, you know, reading more inspirational books. And I was always, you know, like making up these big plans on how I was going to do better, get better, feel better, act better. And I couldn't ever maintain it. And so coming into recovery, into the fellowship of recovery, you know, it's all on me. It's all on me to to take the action, to stay surrendered, to stay connected to that first step experience where I emerge with that desperation of the drowning man, which propels me into the willingness to take the step. And so what it looks like is just every day, it looks like, you know, I, I know that I'm spiritually fit because I'm taking action. Mm-hmm. I'm not checking boxes. I'm not being obedient. I'm not doing things because of how it looks to my sponsor or so people don't judge me. I'm doing things because I am driven by the desperation of a drowning man, the willingness, as well as the absolute gratitude for the life that I have and the desire to have more of it. And so, you know, it looks like getting up in the morning and, you know, starting with prayer and meditation and doing the things that I need to do to stay awakened. And, um, you know, that looks like Sometimes talking to my sponsor and tent stepping throughout the day when, you know, I'm bumping into the people around me when I'm trying to live by self-propulsion where I'm trying to manage and run the show. And <clears throat> it looks like answering the phone when my sponsees call and carving time out of my very, very busy life to meet with them and to sit down face to face and to take women through the work and, you know, carrying the message and, you know, being really honest. And so you know, I know that I am spiritually fit to some extent because I'm not in a bunch of conflict. And that doesn't mean that everybody likes me. That's never going to be the case. But internally, I know that I'm in my integrity and I'm, you know, honestly doing the best I can, not in that cop out way, but in that real way of like, you know, I'm showing up in a way that God would use me and can use me and you know, and then I'm going to bed at night after doing a nightly and, you know, saying my prayers. And, you know, again, it's just action. It's all of the same things I had to do in my, you know, first month of sobriety. I still have to do it today. And, you know, it's no more advanced or different than it ever was. It's just exactly the same. It's just always having to go back to that place of authentically 
seeking that relationship with God instead of just obediently checking boxes. But what would you want someone listening to know about recovery here at the Magdalene House? Oh, there's so much. I mean, first of all, it's free, which I just think is the most altruistic, amazing thing. It makes it accessible. But I don't like for myself, I know that when I was first when I was drinking and then first getting sober, I was so isolated Mm -hmm. and I was so alone and lonely and sad. I was just so sad and dark. And, you know, the Magdalene House is so bright and there are people and connection and fellowship and ways to be just wrapped up and and involved. And, you know, I think that, you know, that's one of the most beautiful things that women get here. And it may look like a flimsy read, you know, it may look like a flimsy read, but it's God. You know, God lives here. God lives here through that connection, through that altruism, through that the beautiful space and the love of the staff members and the volunteers and amazing community partners that donate so much stuff. It's like just every little piece may look like details. They may look like gimmicks. They may look like flimsy reads, but underneath it all, it's this beautiful orchestra with God at the head of it. And it's a place where people get well. And I have seen so many people get well here and that hope that they get to then pass on to the next woman walking in who's shaking and throwing up and sweating and just so desperate that woman who is recovered being able to say i know just how you feel is powerful beyond anything else that i've seen awesome thank you so much chloe thank you this has been a studying the step series podcast hosted by kelsey amos and brought to you by the magdalene house I am Bryn Hansen, host of our Recovered Interviews with Alcoholic Women series. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Tune in every Wednesday for a new release from one of our four series. To learn more about the Magdalen House and the services we offer, visit magdalenhouse.org or follow us on your favorite social media channels.